Okay, can everybody hear me okay with the microphone? Man, John, you almost brought a tear to my eye with that introduction. Just you're, su <laughs> you're supposed to set the expectations of the audience, I think, considerably lower uh, for, for something like this. Um, but I can't thank you enough for your generosity, for all you've done to put together this uh, couple of days here, and also for the introduction. I also want to thank Baylor. I want to thank the Cherry Award Selection Committee for all your efforts. Um, not just to have me here as a finalist, but also just for all you do to foster great teaching. It's an incredible program. I don't know of anything like this in the country or in the world uh, of this magnitude. And I, I think it's a program that you should feel very proud of and I certainly feel very honored to be a part of. I also want to congratulate the other finalists. If you don't know who they are, they're their photos. This is uh, Heidi Elmendorf and Clinton Longnecker. And just if they watch the video later, I'll just say that uh, I certainly look forward to hearing your lectures and learning from you as well uh, when your lectures ultimately go online. A huge congratulations to them. And I'm also, of course, very honored and humbled to be in their company. One of the really cool things about this Cherry Award competition is that we also get to give a home lecture. So we did this at UCLA on October 6th, so about a week and a half ago. Um, this was really fun. It was such a great opportunity to um, talk about education on a campus that, you know, as John may have alluded to, is a very research active uh, place. So this was a really wonderful thing. I also wanted to share with you that UCLA did something. They made an announcement at this thing, and that was that they created something called the Educational Innovation Fund. And this is basically seeded with money that comes from Baylor University. And my department decided to match that funding one to one, uh, basically doubling what the, the Baylor funds would do. And so this is something that we think will be transformative for our campus at UCLA. So I wanted to convey my thanks, and also on behalf of the department, uh, my dean, Miguel Garcia Garibay, that you can see shown in this photo. Um, as well as uh, the campus as a whole. We're really excited about that and, and certainly really appreciate all you do in the different ways that you uh, use this finalist program as a way to promote great teaching. So with that, I wanted to transition to the meat of the talk, and that's to talk about something I hope you all love just as I do, and that's organic chemistry. Uh, hopefully that's why you're here, or you're <laughs> here to learn a little bit more about it. Um, and John kindly told you so much about my background, but he didn't tell you about my my good old days growing up or anything and how I got into organic chemistry in the first place. I wanted to start with a little bit of a personal anecdote. And so that goes back way back in the day to where I grew up. I grew up in a little town called Fishkill, New York. I'm willing to bet I'm the only person here from Fishkill, perhaps the only person here that's ever been anywhere near it. The population is on the order of 22,000. If you were to ask me what I wanted to do when I was a young person, I don't know if I had any idea really. I certainly didn't think I wanted to be a teacher. I didn't know that I wanted to be a researcher. And if you ask me if I wanted to be an organic chemist, I think we know the answer to that is I don't know anybody who, who grew up wanting to be an organic chemist. <laughs> Present company excluded, perhaps. No. <laughs> but my days were actually pretty simple. You know, these days students come into college, they have all sorts of internship experiences and whatnot. I was looking to have a good time with my friends. In order to do that, I need to make money. So I had a couple of epic job. So for one, I was a door-to-door -door knife salesman for some period of time, <laughs> selling Cutco, really nice knives, by the way. I then did the dog census for the town of East Fishkill, so I walked door-to-door -door asking people how many dogs they had. For every dog we found, we got paid 75 cents. So you imagine if we rang a doorbell and heard barking? Like, this was awesome. This was like a payday <laughs> for us in the process. I eventually got a job at Blockbuster Video for the very young students in the audience. Thanks for coming, by the way. Uh, these are VHS tapes. Uh, that predated DVDs, Blu-rays, and of course streaming that we all use today. So those are the types of things that I did when I was in high school, but sure enough, I did a little bit of science, I did a little bit of math. Uh, my parents were both engineers, and for whatever reason, my high school tended to send people to college with the idea that if you were successful in those things, you went on to medical school. And so I had an older brother, he went through that path, he was a pre-medical student, so when I went to NYU, it was really set before me that I would study, med you know, move toward that pre-medical path. And um, so I'd spend my first year, I took biology, I took chemistry, I took physics, I took calculus, I even took, put off these freshman requirements that I think are supposed to be pretty enlightening, but I put them off to like my senior year so I could take these classes and ultimately get ready for the MCAT exam. And sure enough, that year went by fine, and I step into this, organic chemistry. And there are all sorts of warnings that we hear about this class of organic chemistry, and maybe, you know, by the way, I might invoke class participation once in a while. But let me just see a show of hands. How many of you have ever heard anything negative about organic chemistry? Memorization, weed out class, don't worry, I won't judge you, okay? Okay? It's incredibly popular that we hear that. How about on the other hand, how many people heard, aside from the types of nice things you heard in John's introduction or in these pamphlets, how many of you heard that, man, when you go to college, there's one class you have to take. It'll blow your mind, it'll change your life, it'll give you a different perspective, and it'll make you better at problem solving. 
That's, that class is organic chemistry. How many people were told that when they were young? Okay, one, two people in the, in the room. I hope you're an organic chemist now, by the way. <laughs> So for whatever reason, this has been the case for decades, right? So these are the types of things we heard. I heard these things when I was a high school student. I heard it was a class that was filled with memorization. I heard that it was tough. I heard it was a gatekeeper class. And if I didn't get an A in this class, I wouldn't get into medical school, right? That's the type of reputation that this class has had for a long time. Incidentally, my wife's roommate used to get nauseous and <laughs> literally vomit uh, before every organic chemistry exam uh, that she had to take. <laughs> Terrible. She used to tell us this and we thought it was a joke. And then years later, my wife told me that it was actually true. <laughs> In any case, when I went to take organic chemistry, I took it with this fellow. His name is Professor York Rhodes III. Okay, some of the organic chemists may have known this, this fellow. And he spent the entire first lecture, I don't think he showed us anything related to organic chemistry. All he did was tell us over and over and over again, the class had nothing to do with memorization. It was a class that was about critical thinking and it was about problem solving. And this sounded great, right? We left the class thinking, all right, this is a different type of class than anything we've ever seen. Then the material starts to come. <laughs> and then the exam's around the corner and we revert to what we already thought, you know, that we had been really used to doing, both in high school and in my first year of college. And that's to think about memorization when we take a hard science class and think about one thing, and that's how do I get the grades so I can get into medical school, okay? And can I beat the average? Right? So many of those lower division classes are a game of averages. If we can beat the average, we can get an A in the class. Okay? So that's what I thought. I went in, I took a midterm. Right? After the midterm, I talked to friends, I saw the answer key, things like that, and I was like, okay, I, th I think I did better than most people in that, on that exam. So then the next class, the professor is going around. It was a relatively small class. He's handing back the exams, and he hands me back my test, and he doesn't say anything. And I look at it because I got you know, something on the order of a 55%. This was awesome because the average was like a 25. <laughs> right? I'm thinking 30 points above the average, I scored the A. Right? And this is that type of mentality that I think permeates these lower division courses. So I'm kind of celebrating. I'm looking at my friends like, yeah, you know, I, I did okay here. Right? And I'll never forget what happened next. Right? And I don't remember a lot of things from, from college. Um, but I remember what happened. And that's what the professor saw my little mini celebration. And he turned around. He said something. Okay? on the order of, now Neil, that's a, that's a good score, but you can do better. And it wasn't just what he said, of course, it was also how he said this. You know, he gave me one, you know, a little bit of a squint. You know, if you get the squint, you know, pay attention. And then when he was done, he gave me the nod. You know what I mean? Like, you know, the, the nod that you, you need to, you feel me type of nod, right? Younger people, if you don't know what that means, that's these days, instead of that, that type of nod, you might do one of these. You know that <laughs> nod, okay, the what's up nod. So, and I remember thinking like, okay, he's telling me something important. He wasn't mad. He wasn't too happy about it. And my first reaction was to think like, man, what's this guy talking about? I rocked his test. I got an A, right? And then if you think about that in hindsight, that makes no sense, right? I'm celebrating that I got a 55% on a test, right? But that's the type of thinking that I had gotten conditioned to. Uh, that was the type of thinking that I had. It took me a while. I got to know the professor. I got to studying. I started to realize that the class wasn't memorization. It was about problem solving. I started to understand these lessons. It took a little while. The light bulb came on. But ultimately, this transformed my life right, in many different ways. And so I wanted to start with that little anecdote. I think it gives us a couple of lessons, perhaps reminders of things we know. One of them is a really simple one, and that's that the path that we start on in college, it's not always well known what, what, a student will, what path will go down. I think statistics as of last year are that 75% of students will change their major at least, one, at least one time in the United States. Um, and then the other reminder that I think comes of this has to do with, of course, teaching what we're here to celebrate. And the two things I would say about that is that we should never underestimate the way a subject is taught. In this case, we're talking about memorization versus critical thinking and problem solving can have an incredible impact on how somebody perceives a class. And the other one is what happens if you have an inspiring or an encouraging teacher? And the things that a teacher can do can be as subtle as a nod, right? After saying something, you know, kind of, kind of serious, to, to pull somebody out of a certain way of thinking that they've gotten pretty used to. So I think these are lessons that are really important for us all to keep in mind. And they're just my reflections on being a student. And I hope some of the students can resonate with that. I think everybody here can remember some point where a teacher, whether it's in elementary school, high school, or in college, said something really subtle that has still stuck with you today and perhaps had an impact on your life. Okay, so that's my take on education. It had a dramatic effect on me. I went off to um, 
do research in the laboratory, as John alluded to. I was a teaching assistant again. Thank you, John, for mentioning that. And I decided to go to graduate school and whatnot. And the first time I actually had to be on the other side of really teaching a class on myself wasn't until 2010 at UCLA. And in the meantime, the issue of research is really something that I think permeates. I won't say much about it. John uh, said a lot of kind things. But certainly as a graduate student, as a postdoc, and when you start as an assistant professor, the, reset, the research expectations, these are really extraordinary and un, un, unbearable in many ways. So at a place like UCLA, that's a campus that has 13 Nobel Prizes. Of those, seven were from my department, from chemistry and biochemistry. So you can imagine the pressure um, that one feels in that environment. And if you've ever heard these statements like publish or perish, if you want to earn tenure for students, if you don't know what tenure is, it's basically the fact that you're evaluated after a couple of years. <laughs> the outcome is pretty amazing. If you do well and you earn tenure, you have job security for the rest of your life and academic freedom, right? That's really what the tenure system is about. If you don't, you lose your job, right? So the stakes are high in a place like this, and so certainly the research expectations are real. And so I'm just happy to say, I won't say a lot about it, but I have a remarkable laboratory. Um, this is what they look like these days. You can see they clean up well. Um, and they're, I think, at the cutting age of, bo of both uh, research and education. And uh, I'm proud to say that you can see some of the statistics about the lab. Um, they're a really remarkable group, and I'm very much indebted to them. If anybody wants to hear about what we do in the next two days while I'm still here, I'll be happy to tell you about that. But suffice to say, the research aspect of things went fine. But a couple of years into my career, I actually, by the way, even had in my contract not to teach undergrads for the first three years of my career. Right? That's what the research expectations were like. But inevitably, one of my colleagues came in and he said, hey, Neil, you're going to go up for one of these pre-tenure reviews. You should really teach an undergrad class. And they had this opening for this class, Chem 14D. Again, thank you, John, for mentioning it. And that's organic reactions and pharmaceuticals. It's not exactly a crowd pleaser, or it hadn't been. Okay, so you're thinking, get me out of here. Uh, that's sort of the usual sentiment that students have. At UCLA, we separate into two different versions of chemistry. We have a sequence that's for chemistry and biochemistry majors. And then we have one for people that are not majoring in chemistry and biochemistry. That's the 14 series. These are usually people that are life science majors. A lot of them want to go off to medical school, dental school, things of that variety. So they are looking, by the way, these are, we're on the quarter system. And the entire chemistry sequence is four quarters. So that's basically like one and a third years of chemistry, only two quarters of organic chemistry. This is the last quarter. Most students are just looking to be done with their chemistry requirements so they can go on to their upper division classes. The enrollments, as, as John said, approach 400 students. We only have about 360 chairs in the room, so people will sit in the aisles, they'll stand in the back of the room. Um, and it, it's actually kind of a fun environment. It's kind of like this, what we, we see over there on the side. In terms of the student interest in the class, it's probably what you would expect. And we have data on this. This is from student um, surveys that they complete, saying their interest in organic chemistry at the start of the class. And they'll say, the number that say their interest is high is only 10 to 15%. Some will say it's medium, but you can see the overwhelming majority is highlighted by the red color. They say they're interested and this is low. Okay, so that's what it's like going into a class like this and that was what it was like the first time I taught it and usually this sort of thing remains um, over, over a period of years. This is actually the average of six years worth of uh, data that we have. So what I wanted to focus on is I wanna talk a little bit about why organic chemistry is tough. I wanna talk about how despite that, how we can engage students, and I want to, at the end, share with you some of our efforts to take uh, what I would say is a love for organic chemistry and take this to a global perspective. As we go forward, I just want you to keep in mind, I know this is a campus that cherishes undergraduate teaching, and I know there are a lot of extraordinary teachers here. My intent here isn't to uh, tell you the way it should be done. I just really want to foster some conversation. For anybody looking to pick up some teaching tips, I hope that there might be some things here that resonate with you. I would always just say that this isn't a one-size-fits-all model. I think it's important for teachers to experiment and find the things that work best for them. Ultimately, what I'll share with you has been the result of what I'd say is a close collaboration with teaching assistants, colleagues, and even undergraduates who've been involved in the teaching process. And again, the goal here, I hope, is in the spirit of what the Cherry Award is about, and that's to promote conversation, promote ideas uh, that reflect what great teaching might mean. Okay, so to jump right into this, I wanna talk about organic chemistry and why the subject is so difficult. It sounds like you guys all know that this subject has been viewed as difficult for a long time. It turns out people have looked into this and congregated to talk about the difficulty level of organic chemistry. So there was a study that came out when I was a graduate student. This is back in 2002. And what they did is they had a group of scientists. Okay, as you'll see, 1,500 of them came together. 1,500 scientists reached a consensus. <laughs> what they found, can't even say it with a straight face. Right? Of course, finding that science is hard. 
All right, absolutely ridiculous. This is our, my favorite source of satirical news, The Onion. You guys all know The Onion? Okay, this is actually the best part, this guy over here, you know, thinking about science. <laughs> so I remember when I saw this as a graduate student, I'm like, yes, science is hard. And we joke about this, but I think it's true. It's not just organic chemistry. A lot of these science classes, I think, are pretty difficult. I can reflect a little bit on what makes these classes difficult. When I took biology, it was a lot of content. When I took physics and even general chemistry, there were a lot of concepts that some kind of made sense, but things like relativity, you know, threw me off a little bit. At the end of the day, I could do okay, though, because I knew what equation to use to solve the mathematical questions. When you get to organic chemistry, if you don't know much about what it is, first of all, um, just so everybody's on the same page, organic chemistry is the chemistry of molecules made up largely of carbon. Okay, so carbon-based molecules. And for most people, this is something they've never seen before. It's not something that comes up in general chemistry. Most people are not uh, exposed or introduced to this at the high school level. So in a nutshell, it's an unfamiliar language. Okay, I'm going to point to the left side, if that's okay. Um, and there's a lot of language, and I'll point out a couple of the aspects of what this is. When we look at organic molecules, these are the arrangement of atoms. So if you're not an organic chemist and you glance at these things, some of these things might look pretty similar. It turns out, though, that the exact arrangement of these things, these reflect what we call functional groups. And to organic chemists, you do not want to confuse these things. Right? We take these things very seriously. And so all the students, students are introduced to these. We also have... A, you know, a vocabulary that nobody's ever heard of. So we start talking about nucleophiles, we start talking about stereocenters, we start talking about reactions like Diels Alder reactions. And to an organic chemist who's been doing this for 20 years, this stuff is like second nature to us, but for students, they've of course never seen any of these things before. When we think about these functional groups, these are actually just shorthand drawings for something like this. Students need to know what that means. So you can see we don't even draw in the carbons and the hydrogens, typically. That's really what that is. Students need to understand the chemical bonding that's taking place. And then as they learn these functional groups, they learn that they can convert some functional groups to other functional groups using chemical reactions. For that, they need to learn all sorts of reagents. They need to learn all, all sorts of solvents. So if you look at a class like Chem14D, it's in 10 weeks. The students will see about 20 functional groups. They'll learn at least 30 different chemical reactions, all things that they've never seen before. So yeah, it's a content-heavy class. And perhaps that what relates to this reputation of the class having a lot of content and a lot of memorization. But that's actually just scratching the surface, and that's not at all what makes organic chemistry hard. Right? What makes it really hard is as you have these reactions, we try to understand how these reactions occur. So we have these things called reaction mechanisms. And this is just, by the way, a simplified view for my colleagues like Dan Romo. Nice to see you, Dan. We have the, what we call arrow-pushing formalism. So see these blue arrows? These reflect the flow of electrons. We say nucleophiles attack electrophiles. And there's a thought process here for how these chemical reactions occur. We also have these problems we call the chemical synthesis problems, where we convert one functional group to another and another and another. Those could be asked in a lot of different ways. It could be a fill-in-the-blank type of question. But we might also have very open-ended questions where we give students a molecule and we say, figure out a way to make that molecule using the tools that we taught you. And it's very open-ended, which I think ultimately students really enjoy. But initially, it's a little bit different from the type of questioning that we often will give students in lower division science classes. And then if you've ever heard that organic chemistry is abstract, there's a lot of reasons people say that. One of the reasons is the fact that when you have these arrangement of atoms, that we can sometimes draw in these two-dimensional structures, but these are actually three-dimensional in nature. So we have these things like wedges and hashes. This thing is a wedge that's attached to an ethyl group. That implies that that group is pointing out toward you. This thing is called a hash. That's a H. That's a hydrogen atom. That implies it's pointing away from you, sort of behind the board. Students need to be able to visualize that. They need to be able to rotate these structures in, in, their, in their heads and uh, be able to make some uh, assignment of what we call stereochemistry. So if I were to summarize that, it's not about just that memorization and learning some content. The class is really about problem solving. It's about creativity, and it's about abstract thinking. As much as that sounds intimidating, I think those things are perfect for one group of people. Right? And that's our students. This is what our students do. They solve problems. They're innovators. Right? I think sometimes our system gets them so used to the memorization and beating the curve. But our students, they're really here to do this. And we need our students to be able to do this if we're preparing people for the future. The problems we face as society, they're, they're certainly not getting easier. So to me, this is a perfect vehicle, organic chemistry, to get students engaged in these uh, real world skills that we need them to understand. I want to share with you some of the things that we do in the classroom. As we do that, I want to ask you guys to keep in mind one thing, perhaps as a unifying element. And I think 
generally, as we think about teaching and education, we should always be thinking about whether or not the tactics we use allow students to feel connected. As John mentioned, I live with my wife and four children in the UCLA dormitories for faculty and residents. And this is what we teach. If students don't feel a connection, they don't just drop out of a class, they leave the university, right? Issues of student retention, these have been studied for a long time. Here's a study from 1980. In considering what leads to student retention, one of the most important things, what people found is paramount, is just whether or not faculty and staff care Right? That's what keeps students engaged in, in classroom and education. So I think please keep that in mind as we talk about some of the things that we'll do today. So when we go to an organic chemistry class, again, this is something that students perhaps are not looking forward to, to doing. They're not excited about it. So we need to set the tone on the first day of class. Make sure students know that organic chemistry is relevant. I'll give you a couple quick examples of that. A lot of their professions require them to understand it at some basic level. But ultimately, the most important thing that students can get from a class like this is they can learn how to solve tough problems. We also plant the seed that as we go forward, there's going to be more than one right answer to the tougher problems. Initially, that intimidates people, but I think it's one of the most fun things about it. And then importantly, a lot of people, again, are just looking to complete their chemistry requirements. So we remind them that their prior performance in the last three classes they took, it's irrelevant. If they've been smart enough to get into a good school like Baylor or UCLA, they should be smart enough to do this. So if they want a chance to try to earn an A in the class, this is their opportunity uh, to do it. I won't go into the details of how we teach all the details of organic chemistry, but I just want to give you some general strategy. It is a lot of content. It's a lot of vocabulary. So we spend the first two weeks really drilling down the vocabulary, making sure students know about it. We teach the rules of reactivity. We teach that nucleophiles attack electrophiles. And we teach students how to draw these arrow pushing mechanisms. Once they've learned how to do that, they can now start learning new reactions. Right? So we can teach new reactions. We can teach mechanisms. And we always focus on the patterns and generalities. So for the students. When you hear about an exception, right? just me, but most of the times I think students, if I teach an exception, they all want to know, wait, what was that exception? It's going to be on the test. right? And I think that's a mindset we have to be really careful of. And I think instead of that, we should be teaching the generalities and the patterns and using that as a vehicle, again, for people to do more advanced thinking. Because as we do that, we use all that knowledge that they've obtained to uh, solve problems. So we can give them a reaction they've never seen before and ask them to propose a mechanism for how it works. We can give them molecules that they've never seen before and ask them to propose a way to make it. And that's ultimately the magic of what a class like this should be about. I mentioned the relevance as being important. I'll show you some just quick examples, and I'll talk more about it later. I just wanted to make sure everybody knows that organic chemistry is all around us. And as some people say, we literally cannot live without it. So all these reactions that are happening in our body, biomolecules, you all know about DNA. This is organic chemistry at its finest. If you're interested in uh, technology like curved displays, really thin displays, you've probably heard of OLEDs. What does the O stand for? Organic. organic, okay, meaning molecules made of carbon. Okay, so these are organic products. The clothing, right? Everybody's wearing clothing. A lot of very nice, yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> Everybody's wearing clothing and all these beautiful colors. Organic chemistry, again, at its best. So, for example, anybody who's worn blue jeans, you have indigo. Organic molecule to thank for that. Anybody know who this gentleman is? <laughs> Students? Darth Vader. Darth Vader, come on. <laughs> yeah, you guys all know Yoda, I hope. Okay, everybody saw the new trailer for the latest Star Wars. Okay. Students, tell me, what's Yoda made of? The Force. The Force. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, midichlorians, right? That's the other one that we get for this. I hate to break it to you guys, but I think Yoda is made of, uh, what is he made of, a synthetic rubber? Organic molecule. So Yoda, Jabba the Hutt, all these great characters, these are organic chemistry again at its finest. And perhaps one of the greatest things is all the medicines. Every person here has benefited from human medicine. Most medicines that we take are made by and can only be made by the powers of organic chemistry. So I want to make sure you guys all keep that in mind. In terms of how we take a room like this and try to make it more of a classroom environment over the period of 10 weeks, we try to blend the traditional lecture with uh, more common, traditional, uh, more modern techniques. So we'll use a blend of chalk talking and clickers. So by doing a chalk talk, if you will, or using the whiteboard, that allows us to go at a reasonable pace. It gives students time to get confused and to ask questions. And they also, of course, learn how to draw these structures. And then we use the clickers. This is a great way to engage students, make sure that they are learning and understanding uh, as we go. I think um, for anybody who's here in the lecture earlier today that I taught, I see Chris in the back. Um, we did a demo, right? So that's another great way to engage students. We'll do demonstrations whenever possible. And we'll even call students to the board to solve problems that they've never seen. 
And in a class of 400, when a student does that, I think it's just a remarkable thing uh, to witness. So those are the types of things we, we can do to increase student engagement. Um, in some cases, we can establish relevance. And certainly for that student who volunteers in front of a room of 400, that's a really important moment of personal growth. Perhaps one of the most important things that we do, though, is try to work on ways to treat students as individuals and just to show students that we care. I won't belabor the point. There's so many different ways that we can do this as educators. Of course, we need to talk to students. We also need to listen to them, ask them just simple things like, how are you doing? Right? These types of interactions can have an incredible effect on, on the student. We need to be patient for an organic chemistry professor doing this for 20 years or for teaching 20, 10, you know, 10 times the same class. It can be a little frustrating. When it's, what do you mean you don't know what a nucleophile is? Right? But of course, as teachers, we need to be patient ab about these things as we go forward. If we want to challenge people, we have to be there to support them. So we do office hours. We have online office hours. I can explain what that is if anybody's interested. And I'll also meet with, in a class of 400, maybe 100 people throughout the quarter by, by their request and individual appointments. And through that process, when we start to see improvement, we start to see growth, we need to reward that. And that can be in the form of a congratulations, a handshake. It could be a note on an exam, or it could be a, perhaps a, a gift of some variety. So if you were to walk around the UCLA campus, you might see students wearing periodic table towels as superhero capes. These would be the types of rewards that we've uh, given to students in the past, and they'll, again, wear them very proudly. And because of this faculty and residence position, we have really great opportunities to interact with students in the dining halls on campus or even in our own apartment. And those are just really great opportunities to, again, show students that we care. If there's one tactic that I think has been most successful, and you know, my students might comment on this at, at some point, um, and that's a, a really simple one on, sounds simple, and that's to, of course, learn student names. So in a class of 400, at the end of 10 weeks, I can typically learn about 200 to 250 names. And it makes an incredible difference, right? It increases engagement, it makes the classroom more inclusive, and, and certainly it makes people feel like we care, so they don't feel like they're just an, an, a, you know, a name on the roster. I think it just has an incredible impact. So I encourage anybody to do that regardless of the class size, and even in a classroom of 400, it's not the, something that we should be intimidated to do. I wanted to take a minute just to talk about grading. So <laughs> students, what do you think of the curve? Do any students love the curve? Okay. No students love the curve, but we torture them anyway. Right? For whatever reason, the curve is incredibly common in lower division classes. And even the first time I taught one of these classes, I used the curve. And this was partially because I didn't know any better, and it's just something one of my colleagues said to do. It's easy. Just write the curve in your syllabus, and you don't have to worry about it until later. It creates so many problems. Right? Competition is unbelievable already. These are highly competitive students, and now we're really pushing them to their limits where they're feeling like, they don't want to help the person next to them because they might get a, a better grade. I understand the value of competition, but I think it, it, the curve can push it to a, a limit. It also causes uncertainty, where students just want to know how they're doing in the class. And I found myself not being able to communicate to them any guarantees. Right? I always say, wait till the end of the quarter, and we'll be able to tell you better. So this is something I thought a lot about. And around that time, I ran into this guy. You guys all know who this is? I think it's, it's, it's <laughs> some of the students look at they recognize him. This is Ice Cube. Right? He's a rapper. He's a movie star. He's in like 21, 22 Jump Street. Uh, ride-along movies, I don't know if anything else. So this was literally 2011, the year after, and so I'm hanging out with Ice Cube, and I'm like, Ice Cube. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is, this is actually a true story. So <laughs> I said, Ice Cube, do you have any advice I can give to students? Any advice I can give to young people? Like, don't take it from me, I'll take it from Ice Cube. The first thing he said, and I'll never forget it, he said with a real straight face, he said, mind your own business. All right? <laughs> so I thought he was going to kill me at that moment. <laughs> Um, but we had a really nice conversation about this, and, we, and we, we, we chatted about this for quite a bit. He basically elaborated that students need to mind their own business. They're too worried about competition and the people next to them when really they need to be taking care of themselves. And he says this holds true in life and certainly also in the classroom. And I was like, wow, this guy's deep, you know, deep, deep guy, Ice Cube. So I thought this was really profound. I had some other colleagues giving me some other suggestions. So uh, after that, I switched to an absolute grading scale. And I know some people do that here, which I, I think is really commendable. The way it works is we set a bar. We say, if you get a 95 or above, no matter what, you're guaranteed to get an A+. We'll never raise the bar on you, but we might make it more generous. Okay? And it's awesome. We set a high bar, and inevitably, students will meet that. It breaks down those, the sense of competition. It increases collaboration. I think it's had an incredible impact. If you didn't believe the Ice Cube story, there's a, <laughs> me with the one and only Ice Cube. He taught me how to do this. Do you guys all know this, the, the West Side thing? Yeah. So anyway, really a great guy. 
and <laughs> it's actually a true story. Okay, on the topic of collaboration, one of the great things that, one of the great ways that we can foster collaboration are in what we, we call discussion sections at UCLA. So in a class of 400, we'll have four graduate student teaching assistants. These are typically students from my own research laboratory, um, and they're typically very much committed to education as well. And basically the students go to these classes, they're typically 20 or 30 students in the room, and it's up to the graduate student TA to lead those and do whatever they want with them. UCLA though, they started something, some call them learning assistants or undergraduate assistants. It's the idea to engage undergrads in the teaching process, right? So undergrads who've already taken the class, have them come back, they can't grade, it'd be a conflict of interest, but they could do things like go to discussion sections and go to office hours. So the last time I taught this, it was unbelievable, but we brought nine undergrads onto the teaching team. So we went from four <laughs> to you know, like 14 people uh, to be part of the teaching. And you can see Jimmy is actually up here. Actually, is that the same shirt you're wearing, Jimmy? Yeah, it's the same shirt. Um, Jimmy's over here. He was one of them that did that. So what we did is we said, when you go into discussion sections, nobody's giving any lectures. We're just coming in with problems. And we'll write the problems together, the TAs and I. And we'll bring those into class. The students will work in groups, and they'll solve all the problems on the board. So we turn those into an environment that we think is really the epitome of active learning. Uh, at its best, where they have both graduate students and stellar undergraduates there to uh, be involved in that process. If you read the abstract that was submitted, you may have seen something about organic chemistry music videos. And if you're in Professor Zinke's class, you may have seen a little bit about this as well. Okay. But back in 2010, you know, this idea of competition, you know, it was fierce. And so we started to wonder, is there anything we can do to help break that down, have a little fun, and inspire some creativity? And we came up with the idea of how students make music videos. I don't know if it's because we're in LA or what it is, but students got really into this. And I'll just note that right now, you know, these days, you can go online, you can find music videos about anything. But in 2010, this was not a common assignment, right? This was weird. It was actually controversial, I would say, with many of my colleagues. But that being said, a lot of amazing things have happened. So if you look at Chemistry Jock, that was one of the first videos made. It's been viewed over 100,000 times around the world. I'm not saying that's the same as, you know, I don't know, Rihanna or Eminem, whatever young folks watch. But 100,000 videos for, or 100,000 views for an organic chemistry video, right? That's actually pretty good, I would say. So the way the assignment works is pretty simple. We basically say you can work by yourself or in small groups. You make a video, you put it on YouTube. The TAs and I will sit down, we'll watch every one of these videos together, and then we'll assign points. And the points actually just get applied to the lowest midterm. Mathematically, it doesn't work out to a lot of points. We'll even work out the math uh, in the lecture hall to make sure people are clear on this. But they do the assignment anyway. And it's because it's a chance to do something different, something a little bit fun with their friends. And if they do a good job, they have to study and they have to learn some organic chemistry in that process. Okay, over the years, over 1,200 students have participated in this. They've made hundreds of music videos. They've been viewed at least hundreds and hundreds of thousands of times around the world, spreading the love for organic chemistry. We've learned over time that all videos aren't created equally. Okay, no disrespect to, uh, to students who've done this. If you want to check out some of the best ones, I don't necessarily recommend binge watching. You can remember tiny URL and 14D videos, and you can watch some of the best ones uh, online. If the technology works here, I'd love to show you just a little bit of a sampling of these. It's just a two minute or minute and a half highlight reel. Are you guys up for this? Okay. Okay, cool. So just something to keep in mind for the teachers. The only thing I do with this is I give the assignment, right? So everything you're seeing here is the brilliance of the students. in the building. I want to ask one. Sometimes you might get e one. You're the one the first step is making a carbo cation. So with a polar protic solvent, but you aren't done. The algae must be great. Can't be a proton. Now comes your nucleophile. It shouldn't be great. No offense to iodide. Not trying to play a hate. But if instead you have a nucleophile that isn't black, it'll be like you're in a club, cause you got that side attack. On the DMF and that's tone wagon. New mech, alkene chopping, a little bit of ozone, a little bit of solvent. Dichlomethane, demis, rocking, gotta be. Yep, yep, ozone, nothing. Yes, alk, east,
to consider a pro solvents no hinder s in one solvent reaction look out for some 3c action three steps d and d keep it up it's 14 d e1 pops and acid e2 drop that base add toxic acid to protein oh bulky base e2 action that alkene reaction yeah put your hands up cla What do you guys think? Yeah. Pretty good? I'll tell you guys, you know, the, the creativity that comes out of our students and the innovation, it's, it's really an extraordinary thing. And the first time I watched one of these, it was, you know, the first time I saw Chemistry Jock, that's the first video that was highlighted here. I couldn't believe it. There were so many levels of detail and creativity in that. I had to watch it several times over. So if you check out Chemistry Jock, I'd encourage you to look at that and view it and think about it as almost like a work of art and look at all the chemistry that they've incorporated to, I think really to perfection. If you're curious what happens to the students, they all go off to do great things. So the chemistry jocks, if you will, were Yannick, Justin, and Kim. Yannick went off to Stanford for medical school. I think the acceptance rate there is like one or 2%. Justin went to UCSF and Kim stayed at UCLA. We call her a uh, super Bruin, we're the Bruins, um, getting two degrees there. So these are old students now, they're all doctors now. And obviously, I couldn't be prouder of them and all they've accomplished, not just from their music video, but of course, the, the great things that they're doing now and that they'll continue to do in life as they go forward. There's a lot of outcomes of this music video assignment that I hope everybody keeps in mind. One is the idea that they're associating fun and creativity with organic chemistry. They're learning from making their own videos and also watching other people's videos. We've even seen students write lyrics from these uh, videos on their exams next to their correct answer. And then ultimately, again, the love of organic chemistry gets spread around the world. If you add up what all these things do, and I think especially the music video assignment, perhaps the most powerful thing it does, I think, again, it breaks people out of this pattern of thinking about memorization. It gets them to think about you know, letting, letting down their guard. Right? And in this case, I think it can be empowering. And, and that's ultimately what it's about. It's about empowering students to do extraordinary things and to solve the hardest problems that we can give them. And so for us, the hardest problems that I'll give my students are what we call these retrosynthesis problems. We give them a molecule. It's something they've never seen before on an exam. And this might be 15% of an exam where we say, here's the molecule. I want you to look at it and come up with a way to make it using the tools of organic chemistry. These are really difficult problems. And so over time, we started to think about how can we give students a stepwise approach, like a logical approach to solve problems that they can use in other classes as well. So it's a little bit of a, a joke, something we have a little bit of a fun with, uh, a lot of fun with, I should say. Um, but the first step that we teach students for when it comes to dealing with a tough problem, we'll write it on the board, they write in their notes, they'll write it on exams, is to uh, go ahead, get this one out of the way, and go ahead and panic <laughs> quite a bit, right? And it lets the guard down, but it's so true if you think about it, right? If we give a student a hard problem, they're a bright student, and they don't get a, question, a tough question right on an exam, Sometimes it's because they haven't studied enough, okay? That happens. But otherwise, it's not because they're not smart enough. It's because something happens, they go into panic mode, and they can't get out of it in time to recover by the time the exam is over. It's incredibly common. It happens to all of us. It happens to us in real life every day. We make a little bit of a joke of it, make light of it. And so again, students will write down, step one is to panic. And then, of course, regain your composure. Remember, you have the skills, you have the drive, and you have the abilities to solve these extraordinary difficult problems. Tell them to stop panicking, put that brain back into hyper, hyper gear, and then recognize in this case that any of these molecules can be built by constructing together or linking together different pieces. You can make the analogy of a puzzle. In this case, the students are identifying what pieces of the puzzle they need. To put them together, though, turns out requires extra layers of thought. You can't just snap together certain pieces. There's rules of reactivity that the students need to know they need to follow. They need to process this, I think, at an extraordinary high level and put these things together to show a couple of different reactions. Again, in the right sequence, they need to recall the reagents. They need to be, again, thinking very highly. But by and large, they're able to do this. And when they learn how to do this, they get the great grade. This issue of solving the most impossible problems, the toughest problems we can give to students, this is ultimately what I think the class is really about. At the end of a quarter, over 2 thirds of the class will get these problems right. These are literally questions from the uh, final exams from the past. I apologize if this is giving anybody in the audience uh, flashbacks. <laughs> but I'd ask you to keep in mind that these are not chemistry majors that are solving these problems. These are second year life science students. Their heart isn't in organic chemistry coming into this. And they're learning how to do it. And the difficulty level of these problems, these are things that I didn't learn how to solve until I was a graduate student at Caltech. 
But these are the types of problems that we want our students to learn, and inevitably they're able to do it. I told you about the student interest in the material. Their interest, the, the number that said they were highly interested, that was only 10 to 15 percent. You can see toward the end of the class, over two thirds of the class will say now their interest in organic chemistry is high. Some will say medium, and typically less than a handful will say that their interest is low. We had a lot of student quotes. So you can see one here, organic chemistry, not even hard. It's logical. Unfortunately, that student got a C, but <laughs> I'm kidding. He got an A, OK? I wouldn't have done that. OK, and then the other one I think is a really cool one. I felt like Sherlock Holmes, right? Students feel like they're problem solvers. That's the way they want to feel when they're taking a class. That's the value that they're getting out of a class like this. It's not a class about memorization, and the students are beginning to realize that. John mentioned some of the nice things about the class. It's been called the most beloved class. It's been in, the, in a great magazine, and then um, more on the, the web uh, side of things in BuzzFeed. It was the second coolest class at UCLA. When I grew up, if I wasn't number one, my parents always wanted to know, you know who was number one. And so if my parents watch this video later, um, I'll just go ahead and tell you we lost to the history of music. And this is electronic dance music. And so, uh, you know, I guess my, to my dad, you know, I guess we'll get him next time <laughs> if, we, if we have the chance. <laughs> the more entertaining thing um, is typically what number three was. So the class that we beat out just by a hair. So it turns out the actor James Franco, again, it's Los Angeles, he came back and taught a class at UCLA on creative writing and screenplay. And so you can see that multiple efforts to reach out to Franco's people were met without a response. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody in my department really tried to contact Franco's people. Um, anyway, just a little bit of, of fun to be had. But anyway, the class has gotten a warm reception. But I think what's important are the lessons that we take away from this. And I think the two lessons that stand out most to me is that, one, students can learn to love organic chemistry. Not just one or two, not just a few dozens. It can be hundreds at a time that can take that class that's, again, most feared and turn into something that students really love. And over years, this will add up to thousands of students. Right? That can be done. Uh, even for a class like that. The other, I think, has to do with the innovation, right? So if you look at things like the music video, you look at the way the students are able to solve these tough problems, they're often putting down answers that we didn't envision. We didn't put down the answer key. They're coming up with their own creative answers and they're solving problems. So even in the context of organic chemistry, I think what students can do is truly extraordinary. That being said, we've gotten really captivated by these two notions. Let's spread the love of organic chemistry in different ways, and let's engage students in the creative process in different ways that we innovate. I'm not going to go through all these. Don't worry. I'll just point out that in addition to music videos that you saw highlighted, many of my students have made ringtones. You can find these on my website. We also have career documentaries. The students in the lab class, it looks like you enjoyed the forensics video that we showed, but we have students that are in honor sections make these video documentaries to help them learn about and teach others about different career paths. We've also become very invested in the undergraduate teaching laboratory. So we recently revamped the curriculum. We basically destroyed the old infrastructure, built brand new labs, and created a brand new curriculum. It teaches the same reactions, the same techniques we want students to learn, but all in the broader context of different applications like forensics, cosmetics, drug discovery, biotechnology, things of that variety. And we've been able to publish some of that. And then lastly, I've become really captivated, I guess, with this idea of spreading the love of organic chemistry again across the globe. Um, I won't belabor both all of these points. I'll just show you a couple of uh, cool examples. Um, the first one is something uh, we love, and I, I hope a lot of people here like bacon. Okay, so we, we, we had this idea to create tutorials, and we thought bacon was a great name uh, for it. And so bacon actually stands for biology and chemistry online notes. These are written tutorials that help to make connections between what students are learning in the classroom, medicine, real life, and even aspects of pop culture. And the idea, again, is not just to show students in the classroom, but to spread this on a worldwide scale. This was started with a graduate student, Teja Shah, later joined by Daniel Caspi of Element 26, an old friend of mine from graduate school. I see Daniel Caspi also made the trip here. He's now stationed in Dallas. Thanks for making the drive, Dan. Um, and what Dan was really responsible for is making this into an online platform. And you'll see how that works in just a second. A lot of students have been involved, including graduate students and undergraduate students in the creative process. And the idea is really simple. We take all these topics that students learn about, functional groups, alkenes, you name it. And we say, you're learning about this in class. Here's why you should care about it from a practical perspective. And we, I work with the students in the generation of ideas and ultimately the curation of this type of content. Students will take that, these online tutorials um, at home. And it's a supplement, not a replacement for typical coursework. But there's even a little quiz if somebody wants to offer their students, say, for example, extra credit. So um, I won't go through a lot of examples. We have tons of these things. But I wanted to show you one that is 
really important to me personally, and that has to do with the chemistry of alkenes and how it connects to jaundice. Okay, so for students, have you guys all heard of jaundice? Somebody tell me, what's a symptom of jaundice? Yellow skin. Everybody knows what jaundice is. How many people know how it's treated and how that works? Everybody? What's that? Blue light. Do you know how, what it does? Um, it has to do with... Don't look at the slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, beautiful. He says that it's treated with light, and it does some of the solubility, so basically the body can handle it. Right? So really well done. That's awesome that you know that. Most people, I, I would say, wouldn't know them. By the way, nobody was supposed to answer that question, so you know, <laughs> thanks for blowing my cover here. Uh, I'm actually really impressed, so that's really cool. Some of the finer details of what happens with the chemistry I think is really extraordinary. Jaundice, 50% of babies are born with jaundice. Premature babies, over 80% have jaundice. Coloring of the yellow skin. If it's not dealt with, it can cause major problems, including brain damage. So mild jaundice will go away. Severe jaundice needs to be treated. What happens is our bodies accumulate something called bilirubin. We all make bilirubin, but our bodies, our livers can process it. Newborn babies, oftentimes their livers aren't developed enough to be able to handle the bilirubin build up, okay? So what we do with that is we put the babies under light. This is actually my little baby, Andy. I had identical, my wife and I had identical twins. I don't know how she can tell the difference. She swears that's Andy <laughs> under, the, under the lamp. But as we looked into the chemistry, I thought it was remarkable. We teach students about Z-alkenes and E-alkenes and what these different things mean. When, what happens when we shine light on the babies is this thing, the E-alkene, gets excited and it turns into the more stable E-alkene. It's an incredibly subtle difference in the chemical structures, but ultimately this molecule on the right has slightly different solubility properties, and ultimately our bodies are smart enough to know how to remove that from, from our bodies. It blows my mind that this type of thing is used to save all the babies, right? Can you imagine how many babies have been saved by light treatment, right? It blows my mind, and alkene isomerization treats jaundice. This, to me, is the type of material that we should be teaching students, and that's the type of material that one sees in bacon. You can see Andy over here and Brendan, pretty cute little guys. I'm a little biased. Uh, but certainly, we have light and an alkene isomerization to thank for their good health today. We also take advantage of current events. And so we'll look in the newspaper and different news sources and find things and look into the chemistry. So Ali Mali, who also made the trip here, uh, Ali read in the, new, the uh, LA Times and also on CNN that the LA Rams were going to be home to the football team, the Rams, and they decided to build this epic sports complex that's gonna be one of the most expensive complexes built. And they made a big deal of the roof. So you can see the intention here is that it's gonna be see-through, it's gonna be really light material. It's also gonna serve as a billboard so they'll be able to implant lights. And so she looked in the chemistry, it turns out this is gonna be made of something that's the cousin of Teflon, that's the non-stick coatings called ETFE. You can see some hydrogen atoms are replacing some fluorines. And that molecule has these remarkable properties uh, to be used in things like stadiums. And so I think this is an example of how we incorporate modern technology or modern things that are happening into the bacon content to engage students. Also shows an example of the type of things that students uh, like Ali can create in, in the curation of this type of content. The bacon project was started at UCLA in 2016. It's been used by over 23,000, I think 350 students or so um, around the world. So not just in the US, they're used here by students at Baylor. I hope you guys are enjoying them. Um, but you can see it's used in over 15 countries, many different courses, many different schools. Um, it's really meant to be a worldwide resource, again, to spread the love for organic chemistry. And we hope this will continue to grow. And we're even working on a high school version of this to start to get students excited about chemistry. The last thing I wanted to show you is something that's been kind of under wraps that I've been working on with undergrads. So again, we can have undergraduates involved in the creation of educational content um, through this mechanism where they're getting course credit for doing something related to education. So we thought it would be really cool. This actually came out of conversations from, with Will, and by the way, five of the six of them are all here in the audience. Um, conversations with Will about how much he liked to game and how wouldn't it be cool if we can come up with a game that's about uh, organic chemistry. And so we met once a week, and we thought, why don't we choose one reaction that can teach a lot of concepts? So any students here that are organic chemistry students, you probably start, one of the first reactions you learn is SN2, bimolecular substitution reaction. One of the reasons this comes early, it's a relatively simple reaction, and it covers a lot of things like leaving groups, nucleophile sterics, and solvent effects. These are all concepts that we want students to learn early and then be able to apply those concepts as they go on further in the course. So we came up with an app, and it's called Backside Attack, and that's a real chemistry terminology, by the way, that you saw in the videos. And we have, by the way, it's not done, okay? So 
go easy on us, but I hope you like it. I wanted to show you a little bit about how this works and what the students uh, came up with for this, right? So another example of, I think, student innovation um, by this, and I hope this is a resource that turns out to be pretty, pretty cool and pretty useful. So here's what it looks like. You can see there's a nice covered display here. It's called Backside Attack. I might pause it in a second. You can see as it goes on, there's a menu. You can see all the different topics we want students to learn. So you can click on these. There's different levels of difficulty that one can play. Okay, we're going to go back to leaving groups and we're going to click on level three. Okay, again, this is an iPhone or an iPad type game. And once you do that, it says to shoot the nucleophile. So this is meant to be a little bit of fun. Also drive home the concept that nucleophiles attack electrophiles. So you can wiggle the syringe, you can hit the set power button whenever you're ready. And when you do that, the power gauge is going to go up and down. When you want to shoot it, you hit the launch button. Okay? Okay, it didn't work out so well. We still have two nucleophiles left. Don't worry, we got another shot at that. Okay, sorry about that. Nucleophile drops in. Second part is to draw the arrow pushing mechanisms. Organic chemists, again, take this very seriously. So you use your fingers to try to do the nucleophilic attack. Looks like we got it right that time. It tells you now to switch to ejecting the leaving group. Again, use your finger to do this. Okay, looks like we got it wrong. And, oh, we got it right the second time. This is probably the most important point, so I'm going to pause it. This is real where students learn. We say on the last level, the leaving group was hydroxide. Let's make it a tosylate now. Is that a faster reaction or a slower reaction? So for students, is that faster or slower? <laughs> faster, thank you. Okay, it's a faster reaction. But say the student doesn't know it, they just click the button. What happens next is now they tap on the screen to basically kind of put energy into the reaction, and we adjust the sensitivity for how hard they have to tap to correlate to the difficulty of that reaction. So the idea is they make a prediction, they say, it's going to be an easy reaction, I should barely have to tap. Okay, and that's what we want them to see, but if they got it wrong, hopefully they'll learn from that process. So I'll hit play, and basically you'll hear the sound effects from the tapping that takes place. And you'll see that the, as you tap the screen, the molecules come together, you uh, move toward the transition state and overcome the activation barrier. Right, so it tells you to tap on the screen, and here we go. A couple of taps, the molecules come together, you see we have a nice stir bar effect. Okay, and then one last time, tap, 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 and you reach a transition state. Okay, pretty cool. It says, good job. It gives you a little bit of celebration. We hook you up with some points, including if you have the intuition right. And then if you want a little bit more of the textbook feel to it, you can click the check yourself. And we've written text and written our own questions that students can then use to check themselves and, and then go off and learn. Okay, and they can play this multiple times, and the game gets progressively more difficult. So I hope you guys like it. That's not something a lot of people have seen. Um, but I wanted to share that with you today. We're almost done with it. It's really close to being done. I think the only thing that I think is cooler than the app itself and what the students have done here is that they want to make it available for free on the App Store. So I hope you look out for the App Store if you're a student. I hope you download this. I hope this serves as a model that we can teach difficult science topics in gaming. It's something that I hope students will, uh, a topic that I think students will hopefully resonate with. As you came in, I hope you got a coloring book. I won't say much about it. This is a project that came about with my, my wonderful little girls, Elena and Kaylee. You can see their co-authors. Little Kaylee was even featured in Chemical and Engineering News. I don't know if that's a good thing or not, um, but she has a really sweet smile. But the idea, again, is to have students learn more about organic chemistry and see it. Even Bill Walton, he's a UCLA basketball great, NBA Hall of Famer, he even tweeted about the coloring books. So I'm like, Bill Walton gets it. Uh, the impact of all of this. And I hope other people do as well. There's a little introduction that explains more about what that is. We've given over, out over 2,000 copies of that. Um, I know some of you are research active. I'm just hoping that when Kaylee gets older, she doesn't realize that she kind of got stiffed as the second author. So <laughs> if I were to do that again, I would use the equal author contribution symbols in, in the future. Okay? But anyway, it's been a really fun project. I want to leave you with just a few closing thoughts to wrap up. I think the most, one of the most important ones is that students want to learn. This is something we shouldn't forget. Sometimes students get bogged down with the grades and beating the curve and wondering if they're going to get into medical school. But if you push them deep down, they want to learn. right? And so what that means to me is, especially with knowledge being as available as it is online, we have to be careful to ensure we keep the intellectual rigor of our courses at the university level to the highest standard. But that certainly doesn't mean we can't blend that with uh, classes that are fun and relevant. I think it's a winning formula. It's a beautiful formula that helps students reach their own potential and ultimately helps them progress throughout their life. And then the second one is something that I introduced earlier. And it's the fact that as we think about education, there's one group of people that we need to keep in mind, and that's the students. And as we think about the tactics and the resources we use in the classroom, it's all about wondering and making sure those things help students feel a connection. 
Students can feel connected to all sorts of things for a class. Maybe they understand the relevance. They appreciate the issue of jaundice. They could feel some sort of, uh, we're blanking on my word here, but maybe they, they're stimulated by, uh, by a course on intellectual level. Things like the problem solving, the creativity. Maybe these are things that the students resonate with. Maybe they have classmates that they make a music video with or that they study with. This is something that can be very powerful. And of course, that interaction with the teacher Right? This can be a credible thing, and it's something, again, as simple as a nod can have a profound effect on that student's experience and make them then feel connected to the course that they're taking. And I would just offer to my fellow teachers, I think if students feel connected in any one of these ways, that can be an amazing thing that can, I think, have a transformative effect on our students. I think what happened with 14D is that then the ultimate reason that class was successful is because it wasn't just about one of these. It was students connecting to all of these different attributes uh, all at once. And when you do that, I think students left feeling like it wasn't just a course. I think they felt like they were part of an experience, right? And that was an experience that pushed them pretty far out of their comfort zone. It was an experience that took that class that they feared, that class that they didn't want to take, that class of organic chemistry, and transformed it to something that they didn't expect would be magical for them, but so much that they, they love it. And they wait to take that class, and they remember it far along after they've graduated. And that's something that I hope has been felt by, again, thousands of students who've grown to love organic chemistry in this way. Okay, but I'd be lying if I thought that the impact here is about organic chemistry. I certainly love organic chemistry. I think people who know me um, would certainly say that's true. The real magic of what this class is about is it's very little to do with organic chemistry. It has to do with student empowerment, giving opportunities for students to be creative, to solve problems, and be the innovators that we as society need. That's what this class is ultimately about. So these 1,000 students, they go on and they do great things. I showed you a couple of examples of what some of the students have done with regard to the undergrads who take the class and come back and work on projects. So you heard about the Bacon and the undergraduates involved. You heard about undergraduates who have worked on 14D and gone in and taught with us. And you've heard about the app that, that was developed. The graduate students, these people are innovating at an extraordinary level, both with research and in education. These are just some of the graduate students from my own research lab that have worked in, in, on educational projects, you can see that many of them are extraordinary teachers and have been recognized by teaching awards. And I would, I would be mistaken if I didn't take a second to acknowledge the people who traveled here. So Mike Corsella, PhD student, or a recent uh, PhD from uh, earlier this year is here. Extraordinary teacher, as you can see. And then all the undergrads, I showed them before. So Allie and, and Jimmy, if you can raise your hand, they're right up here in the front representing the bacon shirts. Thanks for being here. And then the five for the app, there's Priya, Ernst, Stefan, Will, and Justin, if you guys want to raise your hands. Um, really extraordinary things that they've done here. One student from the backside of TAC team didn't make it. That's Tara. Um, she's a high school chemistry teacher. So her priority is with her students, uh, as certainly it should be. So I'm very proud of her for making that decision to, uh, to be there to teach her class. So um, I don't know what to say without getting too emotional. I'll just say that I think you guys know that it, it means the world to me uh, that you made the trip here to Waco. So I appreciate you guys and, and all that support.